God takes the initiative and sends the gospel out through Paul or you, you and I who have a clear gospel of grace. If happily, verse 27, they might feel after him. Remember, I said it's like a blind man. He, he, he puts his hand out there. They're in spiritual blindness, spiritual darkness. And just like that blind man feels for something that's right there, he embraces it. That's what the gospel that God preaches through Paul and us, Paul and grace believers. If a man wants it, it's there. If happily they should feel after him, verse 27, and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. Paul says God is not hiding himself from man. God is right there. Look what he says. For in him, verse 28, we live and move and have our being as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Now, when Paul says that humanity is God's offspring, what he means is we came out of God. Humanity began back with a miracle of creation where God made from the dust of the ground man. That's Adam. One man, one new man. And from Adam, all human beings were in Adam. And so from Adam, God created a, 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 the humanity. Adam was called the son of God. He was made in God's image and after his likeness. Now, Adam marred the image and likeness of God. We are born in Adam's likeness, but in God's marred image. Genesis 9, when Noah came off the ark here. God told him that if a man sheds man's blood, capital punishment, by man shall his blood be shed because man was made an image of God. So although it's marred by sin, we are the offspring of God. That doesn't mean we're all his children. You don't become children of God unless you trust Christ shed blood, right? You become the sons and children of God through faith in Jesus Christ. But, but humanity was a direct creation from God right there in Adam. So mankind still has an image of God. It's marred, but we still have his image. Now, the likeness is given back to us through the Pauline grace message. Paul talks about godliness, the doctrine which is according to godliness. How do we get that, our godlikeness back? It's through sound doctrine committed to the apostle Paul. So God says here, we're his offspring. Look at verse 28. He says, as certain also of your own poets have said, I noticed that the apostle Paul and you can do this. Paul was a very educated man, even before he became uh, uh, Paul the Apostle, Saul of Tarsus. And, and you can use contemporary uh, things that, that your audience understands. These Greeks had all these philosophers, Plato and Socrates and Euripides and all these guys. But they also had all these poets. And so Paul goes into their own history about some poets, some secular poets. When I did the study, it was... A, it was it was their different poets named Erastus, Cleanthes, and Homer. You probably heard of Homer and another guy named Jove. Well, these different poets over there in Greek uh, history spoke about these things. They talked about how mankind, their own secular uh, poets, how mankind was an offshoot of the gods. Now, it was the unknown god. Paul is telling us who the real god is. But they actually said it in their own uh, doctrine. Go over, to me with, go over with me to Titus. This issue of when you talk about the own, your own poets, why did Paul bring that up? Titus chapter number one. He does it again. Titus chapter number one. As Paul speaks about members of the body of Christ, this is interesting. The Cretans. The Cretans. Look at, uh, you ever heard someone say you're a Cretan? It's an old time, like he's a, he's a scoundrel, a Cretan, right? Well, they get it from the Cretans. The Cretans were a, a group of Gentiles. And uh, it, it, look what Paul says, Titus chapter number one. One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, the Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and slow bellies. These particular saints who were of this area of Crete, they were believers, but they were acting like lost people. And there was a stereotype amongst these believers that they were liars, all way liars. In every way, they were liars. So they were huge liars. They wouldn't tell you the truth. Evil beasts, the beast devourers, they were just scoundrels in their actions. These, these are, this, was, this was the people of Crete as a whole, but the, even the believers, the, the believers hadn't renewed their mind. And they still acted like these other Cretans. They were evil beasts. And it says slow bellies. That means they were lazy gluttons. You know, people say, oh, you're so mean to say that and say that. If you ever watch the Apostle Paul and the Lord, 
They were mean in their speech more than anybody you ever see. He called them foolish over there in Galatians. He says they're evil beasts and liars and slow bellies. That was the Apostle Paul speaking about believers, okay? So don't be so, you know, everybody is, is always worried about everybody being kind and stuff. Well, sometimes you have to do this. Verse 13, Paul says this prophet, this was somebody who spoke to these, these uh, Cretans. This witness is what? True. Paul didn't say, oh, don't say that about them. He says, you know what? You know what those guys are saying about these Cretans? As the apostle, I'm telling you, that tr that's the truth. And then look what he says to Titus. Wherefore, rebuke them softly, no, sharply, that they may be sound in the faith. Paul the apostle, depending on how the person was he was speaking to, if they were meek, he was meek. But if they got like this, he went right back at them. He told Titus, you rebuke them sharply, they might be sound in the faith. Those were believers. You can only be sound in the faith if you're in the faith. And Paul says, you go there, Titus, and set those guys straight. Titus, he was like that. He was a strong personality. If Paul needed a softer personality, he sent Timotheus. But if he needs somebody to get the job done, he did that with Titus. So that's what he means here when he talks about your own poets. Go back to Acts 17. So just why did Paul quote these poets? Because you can do that. We might talk about William Shakespeare or something like that. You can quote these poets. They're not the word of God, but Paul just uses something contemporary. Okay? Verse 29. For as much then, Acts 17, verse 29, as then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the, what's that next word? Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by arts and man's device. Remember these Gentiles, they would make these idols, and they'd make them of gold and silver and precious stone. They'd make them all of these idols. And when he talks about the Godhead, um, let, me, let me show you what he means by that. That's a, that's a word that we don't use much. It's a, it's a Bible word. It, it, it has to do with the Trinity. The word Trinity is not in the Bible. You see, tri, unity, and that word Trinity is tri, unity. And what it is, it's a description of who God says he is in Scripture. From the beginning, way back in Genesis, there's one God in how many persons? Three persons. There's the Father. What we know as the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost is the Godhead. So when the Lord tells his apostles there in the book of Matthew 28, the Great Commission, go out into all the world and preach the gospel, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. He's going to teach through those Jews. Uh, Steve and I were talking about that. After the rapture, God is going to teach the nations through the Jewish people who God is. And he's the Father, the Son, and Holy Ghost. We call it the Trinity. It's that word triunity, triune. I call it the triune God. Three and one. They're the same in essence. They're the same in, in, in deity. They're three different. They're the Father. And the Son is called the Word before he became Jesus, before he became the Son. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, okay? So it's all through Scripture. But the, the Bible word for that is the word Godhead, okay? Go to the book of Romans, Romans chapter number one. Paul uses it again. I just want you to see when you talk about the Godhead, that's, that's what it is. It's the Trinity, the triune God of the, of the Bible. Look at uh, Romans chapter number one, if you will, and verse 20. Paul says Gentiles have no excuse not to know God. And not only to not know God, if you listen to the testimony of God through Paul, You'll learn about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Watch this, the Godhead. Verse 19, Romans 1, 19. Because that which may be known of who? God. God is manifest where? In them. God put a God-shaped vacuum in every... Well, he didn't put a vacuum. It recreated... The vacuum came after Adam's sin. He put a knowledge of God in Adam. Gave him his word. And so because of sin, there's this vacuum and men and women try to seek riches or fame or fortune or, or, or you know, uh, um, wine, women and song, whatever. They, 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 all these idols, sports, this, that and the other, you know. Well, what they're seeking is something to worship. And if it's not God, it's going to be the creature. If it's not the creator, it's going to be the creature. It's going to be people. It's going to be things. Well, they're not supposed to do that because verse 19 it's manifest in them for God hath showed it unto them. He did give a testimony. 